Oh, that's that, I'm reading about that right now. I'll show you later after show. You're watching the Ed Reach Network. This is the Google Educast, part of the EdReach Network, giving educators a voice, a big voice. You've reached episode 67 for October 3rd, 2012. Fourth. Oh, man. That's what happens when I don't look at the document. Uh, for October 4th, uh, 2012. Uh, and now your host. Who's hosting this show? Me. That's Diane. why you should look at the Diane document. Diane Main. Take it away, Diane. Welcome to the Google Educast, the show where we talk about educational applications for Google products, including news, tools, tips and tricks, and classroom applications. I'll be your host, Diane Main. This week, we have a fantastic group, including... Fred Delventhal. Fred Delventhal. <laughs> Kevin, Kevin Brookhauser. And Sean Williams. And we may have a guest. And hopefully Chris Scott later on. <laughs> no, Cameron, go away. <laughs> yeah, woohoo, Chris Scott. He's, he snuck up on me and goes, yeah, me. <laughs> All righty. So anyway, little little note here. Are you a disruptor? Whether it be a teacher, student, or the system, we can't deny that education is currently in a state of disruption. The Disruptors channel on EdReach on Edreach highlights all of the things, news, technology, products, or simply a point of view that contribute to the transformation of our education system. Check out the new Disruptors channel at edreach.us slash disruptors, and let's disrupt EDU. Alrighty, so let us. I'm actually, have you looked at, have you guys looked at the, the people that are contributing to that blog? Yeah, I saw yeah, Stumpy's in there, and, and uh, Andy Losick. Andy, Andy, um, Oh my gosh, I'm totally... Aaron, Aaron's in there, right? I think so. I can't remember. Yeah. I, just an all-star lineup of people yeah. contributing to that. So looking forward to seeing what comes out of there. Cool. That's all. Awesome. So let's start with other things that are also in the news, like spring cleaning in the fall. Who wants to jump in on that? More things are being closed by Google. Sad. Yeah, I put this in... Um, uh, I think because of uh, what would be of interest to people that would watch us are the spreadsheet gadgets. But um, one of the things that I learned when I was doing a presentation this summer on spreadsheets was a lot of the gadgets I found also in the charts. So they're sort of taking out the gadgets part and most of the things, the more popular ones, have already been rolled in like um, if you wanted to put in a whole bunch of addresses, having a map show up um, with those place marks already on the map, uh, then that's in the charts instead of gadgets. So uh, they're also merging the Picasa and Drive storage. So if you had Picasa space that you paid for, then that's being rolled into Drive. And most of the other stuff I just didn't think really applied. Did it apply to any of you guys? I didn't get a chance to look yet. It okay. didn't apply to me, but I, I did want to pick your, your collective brains about the whole Picasa thing. I'm, on the one hand, really pretty excited about... Um, I've been waiting for him to do... Like, Picasa and Drive have been kind of separate, but together kind of weirdness for the last what, like four or five months? And so I'm kind of excited that they're doing something with Picasa again, and it, it seems like it's going to be more full integration into Drive. But then, like, the storage and everything was actually kind of confusing for me, which I know I'm kind of simple, but... <coughs> um, so I don't know. I, what do you guys see coming out of this? I, I, and, you know, to preface it, I love Picasa. I think it's awesome, and when... Getting Picnic baked into Picasa, I was like, 
Yes. Mm -hmm. Big thumbs up. That's awesome. But then this whole, like, there's Picasso web albums, and there's your drive photos, and your, there's your Google Plus integration, and they all seem to be living in, they're all related, but they're all in different silos, and, and they don't seem, it's like, oh, if I want a web album, if I want a slideshow, I need to go to web albums. If I want to do some editing, I go to drive. If I want to instant upload, I go to Google Plus. But, so do you think this is going to bring, like, all three of them closer together, or? Yeah, well, it seems like Google has a bunch of uh, all of their tools are these these circles. Not to use a Google Plus term, but but they're circles that are overlapping into these Venn diagrams, right? Right. But the Venn diagrams don't work well with each other necessarily. Yeah. Or yeah. Communicate exactly. Well with each other, and uh, you know, I actually I, I think they know what they're doing by trying to streamline their products. Let's all move over to Google Plus for, for most of these things, and uh, I think it's going to be a better user experience. Uh, I hope so, because, I mean, they're, like, all three of those are, are great features that, you know, Picasa, yeah. Drive, Google Plus, you know, there's just so many great things, but I think you're, uh, that's a great analogy. We need to change it from a Venn diagram to a circle. Yes, one We need them to overlap and actually get that integration where everything plays well together. Yeah. So I'm just looking at the the charts and spreadsheets. So I've apparently been very busy and not noticed that there's like a million chart types now. Um, but I'm wondering if because wasn't one of the gadgets the um, word cloud thing and you could make a word find as well? Yeah. That used to be fun to show teachers. You know they'd never actually end up using it, but it was like a nice little little thing they could take a toke of and get hooked, you know? So take I don't see toke. some I don't see something that's that. the same. She no, did. that wasn't me. What are you talking about? I'm sure I don't know what you're talking about. So am anyway. I only, am I the only one getting word cloud fatigue? Well no. Okay. I think sometimes well, I see them overused. Because they just I, seem so meaningless to me most of the time. It's like, students, innovate, collaborate. It's just like, I don't need to see a whole bunch of buzzwords. Well, I think you're right, but that's people that are trying to, um, and uh, first, I'm totally guilty of this. <laughs> just putting it out there. But where you're trying to, <laughs> trying to, um, what's it called? When you ju jump the system and you're like, I'm going to use the word, um, engage 14 times so it turns out large and then I'm going to use the the word you know um, common core with a tilde right. 12 times so it's almost as big but not quite and you know when they're trying to you know game the system and make it happen it, rather than using something more organic right you know what I think about for analysis though and that's where that's kind of where I'm going with it is when you use it organically to copy and paste a student text into the box and see like what word is produced most often or a presidential speech or whatever I mean it would be interesting to see the word clouds from last night and see which word was used most often and all that stuff right. I think those uses of it are totally valid and justified but I think as far as the idea of using word clouds I think we're kinda of at that point where people are are gaming the system but I am excited to see more people using services like Tagzito and, um, gosh, what's the other one? Where where you can do more than just create a word cloud, but you can shape it into what you want and, mm -hmm. you know, well, be more creative with it. So I think we see yeah. a lot more things than what most people see, though, too. I think we're exposed to a lot more of these different things, and it's easier for us to get fatigued than a lot of other people. Sometimes somebody sees a word cloud, like, in the year 2012, and... It's as if they just discovered something, and we're like, yeah, no, it's been around a while. But it's have easy to be seen, jaded. But have you seen Guess the Word Earl? Jen Wagner. Yeah. And what, I mean, Jen Wagner, the host of the back channel here on the Ed Reach Network. Um, and she will be Guess joining us. She and, will be joining us here, Sam. Okay. Probably. And she does wonderful things with, I mean, Yes, it's she could just list the words on the page, and then you have to guess the relationship, whether it's you know science related or literature related and stuff. But it puts it into a different light 
just by having it in a word cloud. No, the prominence doesn't really matter that much in them, but just in terms of seeing Harry, Hermione, and you have to guess, okay, it's one of the Harry Potter books or something like that, um, just put in a word cloud makes it better. So check that it out. Does. It does, and that's one of those great organic uses for it that, you know, isn't... Uh, you know, I I hear you, Kevin, but I I think the reason we're getting jaded is because we're not seeing a, a true use of the word cloud for the what yeah, it can do, but exactly. trying to, you know, right, right, right. Is that a dead horse I hear? Stop beating it! All right, let's do this. No, I'm just laughing because that wasn't even in our plan. I love the things that just come out of, you know, wherever, and we should make a word cloud of that little discussion right there. See how many times we said word club. All right. Up next, more than a map, explore the full power of the Google Maps API. Has anybody had a chance to take a look at this? No. <laughs> Let's I now. haven't. I have not yet. Yeah, but it does look very promising. Let's Who added that? I may have. <laughs> yes. Oh, yeah, you did. It is. I, I mean, even though Diane shared it, I've been kind of following along with this because Google Maps totally opened up their API and they're doing the, the they're totally crowdsourcing things, and it's pretty awesome. All the things that are going on, and you know, as we're looking at this slideshow here, all the different things you can do with Google Maps now. Um, one of the things, Fred, you were talking about earlier about the search course, and one of the things. One of the questions in the search course that I was kind of surprised at was um, it had to do with whether you would use Google Earth or Google Maps to, you know, to, I forget what the question was, but, you know, it was like, it was really specific, and it was like, you can use Google Maps to get Street View to do whatever, you know, and that was kind of knowledge that you had to have. Mm. Did that make sense? Uh-huh. But Street View is also available on Google Earth. It is, but you've got to download Google Earth and have it running where uh, if you're using it in Maps, you can just check it out in your browser, drag and drop uh, Pegman, Pegman, Pegman. Yeah. And, which, you know, I'm waiting for him to come out with Peg Woman because I'd really like to see it from a woman's point of view, but... I'll, I'll just tell you what you need to think, then you'll have a woman's point of view. Exactly. Hey, can I make a somewhat related... Uh, rant about maps. Please do. We love um, your rants. So you may know that I'm I am an iPhone user. I've tried to be an Android user for a while. I love my Nexus 7, but I haven't found a phone that I like as much as the iPhone. Um, except I did download the new iOS and the new oh, maps, wow. which which uh, Tim Cook has apologized for, but. I'm uh, traveling with family on the East Coast right now, and I was looking for a particular greasy spoon in the in the uh, middle of Raleigh, North Carolina, and I type in the at the name of that greasy spoon, and it took me to a country club. The the uh, the caddy actually opened my door before I realized that they had taken me to the completely wrong place. Oh, the, no. uh, iOS Maps is just awful, and I miss my Google Maps so much. Um, Google Maps is amazing, and they've what's really cool is they've just released a bunch of new uh, uh, high resolution imagery at 45 degrees. It's unbelievable. <laughs> That's why well, I'm not updating mine. Did you see that they now have it? Um, they released either today or yesterday. Street View for mobile maps for Google Maps, so you can just add the link to your um, web page or to your home screen on your iPhone and just use Google Maps anyway. Nice. So, so uh, okay, I probably shouldn't. Yeah. Right. Okay. Well, I, I was like, I, I <laughs> did the iOS 6 update, and, like, everything is wonky. It's awful. My husband did, and it's, it's, his battery life is sucking. So I'm not, I'm not upgrading mine at all yet. Don't scroll down. <laughs> Kevin, don't scroll down. Unless what? you're Kevin. Don't scroll down, Kevin. Unless you're Kevin, scroll down. All right. All right, we need to move on. There's another item in that HuffPo article, and the first picture is not 
friendly for the show. <laughs> but I can't say toke. All right. Uh, speaking of maps, from the Google Earth blog, they had this thing about visualizing the zero access botnet, which I'm going to be honest with you, I don't understand what any of this is about. But it looked fascinating, and it had a lot of little do thicky things, this little push pen things on a map or on the globe, actually. So um, there's this malware that's been infecting computers all over the world for quite a number of years, and they think it's been installed over 9 million times with roughly 1 million PCs still infected to this day. And so um, they know of enough of the infections that they've plotted them in Google Earth. And when you look at it, anybody got that visual up? Because I'm looking at it on my computer, forgetting that you're all over there in the Hangout. Um, Fred's got it. All Fred's right. got it up. See all that red? It looks like the, Ameri uh, the American continent has the measles in the United States and the continuous 48. That's uh, little pushpins of infected computers. Like how they know that I'm not totally sure. But, but that's one of the, you know, I'm going to make a little segue here that when I'm leading and, and trying to teach people about um, Gmail especially, is the power of Google to do good stuff where it's like Google can track and know that these things are happening and plot, plot it out on a map there and I'm trying to you know teach people and show them that uh, you know that's the way Google works with the spam and stuff like I've gotten 10 maybe 15 pieces of spam that made it through all of Google's filters to my inbox in the last three years. I get more than that. Well, that has to do with your search history, but never mind. No, it doesn't. I, you do all my searching. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> did, you, did you mark up those stickers to say... Let Sean do that for you? Not yet, but I did want to take a second here to show these off. Fred, so you are going to be totally jealous. This is adorable that you even are so excited about this. Oh! Is one of those mine? I've got a couple for you, and um, <laughs> I've got a couple that I've got to send to certain people, but yeah, I ordered, I ordered enough to cover it. All right, awesome. So anyway, I just thought that was interesting. I always, I always like when there's some kind of an application of one of the geotype apps that kind of reaches out into other areas. I just think that's cool. So there. And then this other thing that kind of also reaches into the realm of social studies, um, of course, with the debates being on last night, there have been a lot of um, posts on Google Plus about uh, from Google Politics and Elections, which is one of the many. Um, Google channels basically on Google Plus and uh, they have all these really cool infographics and different resources for teaching current events, government, that kind of stuff um, and especially lately related to the upcoming debates for the last few days and then last night's debate so they've actually got um, they've been putting these cool things about what people have been searching during and after the debates and when the different presidents or candidates were speaking um, they had a poll, like a who won the first presidential debate. That infographic was put on there this afternoon. Um, they've just got this, like, a lot of, lot of search interest-based stuff, but then also um, the top four related search terms during the, the Wednesday's debate during uh, with Obama, with Romney. So I just think that's really neat. Um, so if you were following along while the debate was happening, you would see these pop these things popping up different times. And then it was who's planning to watch before that on October in favor of, strongly in favor of, etc. So it's just really neat the way they're taking some of the just current topics and things that are of interest and visually representing that and sharing that on the Google Politics and Elections page. So I thought that was a fun little share. The link in the show notes goes directly to their page. And that's just one of something like 29 uh, Google related pages that I have in a group and then I can just limit uh, my my Google Plus what do you call that? Stream Circles. to just those things. Well no, I mean limit, limit okay, the view of what I'm seeing, yeah. And so that's how I find content for the show. <laughs> we all do. And yeah. um, just a little aside, I, I 
think Google and Education is going to have some announcement coming tomorrow or yeah, Friday. Yeah. Ooh. So you might want to watch the Google and Education page tomorrow. I think they're going to be doing some some announcing. I want to know what that is. Well, I'm just guessing that it might. Like, remember, it was around this time last year that they did that whole. I think they're going to announce it tomorrow. Okay, so, cool, cool. You heard it here first. Well, <clears throat> and also tomorrow's it, Google and Education has been posting some videos leading up to tomorrow being what's the fancy name for it? World something teacher about education. World Teacher Education something something something. Now I'm scrolling back through and I can't find it. Can I find it? No, I can't. But um, I actually shared out a couple other things, so I can probably go to my profile and find them. But wish we had a um, power searcher in the group. I know that would be really Isn't good that if you we did. Brad? You're the only one that's certified. Oh, Google and Education World Teachers Day. They've been sharing some really cool videos. Um, so there's probably something going on tomorrow with that. So there. All right. How's everybody feeling? Feeling good. All right. I was going to say the love, but. Okay. Um, Take a stand for teachers. I'm sitting down. All righty. <clears throat> so, a um, little tool shout out, Kevin. Yeah. I, coming through Kevin, in a pinch. I figured you, you could use that. Uh, let me share my screen here. So, our school uses Google Calendars for our school calendar and, and for athletic calendars, a bunch of different things. And so what I did is, as I just mentioned earlier, I'm still an iOS user on a lot of devices and I know a lot of people are out there who are using Google calendars. There's, there's a way to sync your iOS devices, the actual native calendar app on your iOS devices with Google calendars and I've posted the instructions with a video of how to do that uh, here on my blog at iTeach, I think, and that'll be linked on the show notes. But that's a huge time saver. You can create calendar events on your iPhone, and they automatically sync with all of your Google calendars as well. Um, cool feature if you're using iOS and Google calendars. Now, is there any difference between syncing a personal account versus syncing um, your calendar that's in a Google Apps for Education account? Uh, as far as I know, it, it depends on the, the admin settings in the background. If, yeah. Uh, you know, if there are calendars that are editable by people outside the domain, then that would work. But you can actually sign in with your Apps for EDU account. So I assume that even if uh, it's restricted outside the domain, you can still connect it. And it's using it's actually using Exchange to sync yeah. the, the two. Um, and uh, not that it's using the Exchange server, but it's using the Exchange protocol. Okay. Yeah, I know that um, with, from the administrative side of an Apps for Ed domain, you can turn on or off whether or not that kind of syncing can happen to mobile devices, and so that mm -hmm. would all be under there. So it just depends on what the administrator. I think the default might be that it's allowed. I'd have to check. Ours I think it is. I think for it is. students is not, but the students would like it, and... My boss is like, should we or shouldn't we? I'm like, why not? What's the risk? I don't understand. I, I don't believe that there is a risk, but I think he's just, he tends to be more cautious. So, Right. I, I tend to be the one that gets in trouble and has to apologize. <laughs> <to me. clears throat> That's already happened a couple times this week, I think. Anyway, thank you for having a tool shout out for us, Kevin. That's cool. It's good to know. Um, you know, while, while you're getting lost with your with your new Apple Maps, at least you can tell what day it is. Exactly. So in our next segment, Ask a GCT, this was kind of neat because this just came in right this afternoon. Um, oh, and I can see that Chris Scott is in the document, so maybe we could pull him in. Um, we got this note. Hello, can you help me? We uploaded some videos to YouTube to share with parents and the community. The students love this. Of course they do. Today we got an email saying that a company claims copyright on the videos and reserves the right to place ads on our videos. These are just videos from our first day of school. Students reciting a poem they wrote in class and a review of the lunch one day. These videos don't have any music. How can a company claim copyright? What should we do? From Sleepless in Seattle. Really? Anyway, um, I'm glad you it asked was, this. Really. I know I know it was, but um, 
I'm saying really to them. It's been done. So um, I do have to say, does anyone want to jump in before I get up? I want to go last. I want to go last? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, overachiever in him. Um, anybody else have something to say before I jump in here? Well, I, I just put in, um, because this came out today, that YouTube was um, lessening their uh, ID con or content ID system so that it would be blocking less automatically. Yeah. You know whether or not through identification and how that works with the companies involved that are doing it, whether or not this would affect this person that wrote in. Well, you know, I do think a lot, of, a lot of false positives come up, but there's also, so like what they're describing, I, I didn't get a chance to see the video in question. We emailed, Kevin emailed them back, and then I emailed them back as, as well to say, could you give us a screenshot? But Kevin asked if, if we could see the video, not to show it on the show necessarily, but um, so we can get an idea. If there's even music playing in the background, that'll yeah. trigger. But sometimes you just get false positives that are totally false positives. Um, I have had at least three, maybe four times had copyright claims. And now, by the way, copyright claims often will just mean that they, they can put ads on it, mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't, it doesn't, and sometimes it won't be um, viewable in certain countries. But it doesn't uh, change that happen. status. But it doesn't, it doesn't change it, uh, the ability for it to, to be used or anything like that. Yeah. Um, it's very rare that they'll strip the audio out, and that's if, if like, a whole song is totally in there, and, you know, it, it's the only audio in the, in the, in the video. But I've had um, false positive, what I consider false positives, on music that came out of iMovie, the music that comes with your Mac. I've had that happen three or four times at least. It ju I just got another one recently on a song I've already disputed, the same one. Um, different things are having claims to it. And in one case, I found out that someone made a copyrighted song that included samples that come with iMovie. That's cheap. Um, so there's that. And then also, when I use the karaoke versions of songs, for my song parodies, and, and I've had a couple of those that I made videos of, it pulls that up as being um, copyrighted. And while the karaoke song is copyrighted, it's actually, you can, you can do song parodies. That's protected. That's a free speech, fair use type of thing. So in every case, I've been able to get the, the claim removed. And it's really just a matter of explaining, this is, you know, here's the law on this, and you can't... Um, you, you, I dispute this, right? In the case of stuff that was written by kids, wow, that's an interesting noise. In the case of stuff that was written by kids and, and talking about the lunch that was served at school that day, where's the copyright? If anything, the copyright rests with the kids, right? They, they, they're, the, they're the writers of it. Uh-huh. All right, so for this person, now I'm just playing the question here. Sure. You say they need to dispute it. Who do they dispute it to? Well, when it comes, have you ever had this happen in one of your videos? Yes. So you have the there's a link that you can click where you have the option to dispute it, and and you you say I want to dispute it. You have to say I know that what I'm doing is disputing it. Then you basically have to say again, yes, I know that what I'm doing is disputing this. I I really mean it, and then you have to type in your reasoning. So, um, but but again, like. I could walk them through the process if I could see what they're seeing, but like usually what happens is you get an email, um, and there'll be some kind of something on the video itself too, but you get an email, you follow the link in the email, and it explains to you why the, the claim is in place, and there's a way to, to dispute, if you want to dispute it, click here kind of thing. So Shauna, I have a related question, but uh, did you want to finish first, or do you want me to ask the question before you finish? Oh, go for the question. Okay, so the videos that I'm creating right now are making use of Google presentations and the Life Magazine photos that are included in Google presentations, which I'm just assuming are in the public domain or at least the rights have been released. Do you guys know if I need to cite those, if I use those in a YouTube video, or are they just free range? I would cite them anyway because <clears throat> when you use, when, when you do a Google search and you choose a, a Creative Commons licensed image. There's it, gives, it gives you this, the, the, the link so that you can cite it. Yeah, um, but I don't know if it, if it um, gives you a similar link for the ones in life. I can't remember right now. But I would say cite them because it's, 
it, it's not anything that I that is not my own work. I'm going to cite because I want to think it's, that it's not my own work. I think it's a uh, good practice to cite them, but I don't right. think you have to because it's um, is it public Google domain? bought Google bought the rights to it, and as a Google user, you have the rights to use it. Okay. Does that make Anything sense? Anything that Google does, or if you choose to use them in, um, like, drag them into a YouTube video, is that, does those rights transfer? Yeah, that's what I thought Kevin was talking about. Yeah. That's what I'm doing. Because you're still using them in a Google product, and Google brought, bought the images for you to use as a Google um, user. Yeah, I mean, I never left, the, left the Google the, You're not... Lo hmm. Yeah, you're not leaving the environment, so you should have permission to use them. But like Diane says, it's just good just practice good and format to say, you know what, this is where I got them from. Yeah. I don't know that I don't know that I would take the <clears throat> the time and effort because I'm kind of lazy to cite every individual one. But I think like it would be easy enough to say mm -hmm. all of these images are from Time Life archives or whatever through right. Google Images. I wonder um, if Chris Scott has anything to add, and then Sean, you wanted to really go last, right? <laughs> uh, I don't. Yeah. I, hey Chris, guys, look, it's Chris Scott. That is. Who is this uh, is he bearded man? He's he's still muted. Oh, dude, because you need headphones, man. He's got his headphones in. Do you? No, he doesn't. Look. He's got earbuds. Well, no, he's got. He's got to put him in. in. Okay. He had no, one he didn't. In. He lied. All right, unmute him. Yes, no. Can we bring him back from Sean? I think you muted him, didn't you? Yeah, Sean, you muted him. You got to unmute him. Uh, he's unmuted. He probably just doesn't even have a. No, you just oh, muted no, him. No, you just muted him. I know, but I unmuted him. No, how about now? Oh yeah, because your yeah, sound is crap, man. You can wave, man. Something's wrong, Chris. Chris, you got wicked oh, sound. So when I unmute him, we get that. Yeah. That's sad. I'll just Chris finally made it. Wait, I think I heard him. Yeah, he heard you can him, hear him, but it's got that buzz. buzz. He yeah. speaks. Do you have an external mic, Chris? <laughs> While we figure out, Chris, Sean, why don't you tell us what you think about the whole copyright well, claim I was on just YouTube videos? I, I, I don't know. I wanted to get... Um, <laughs> <laughs> Hard to focus with Chris there. Um, I wanted to get your opinion actually on like this whole fair use thing, and I'm kind of wondering because it sounds it sounds like another situation where it was totally unbased, where somebody had filed uh, the same kind of use thing, and I'm wondering if people aren't starting to troll YouTube and file these suits just like. Why not? See if you, I can get it to stick and place my ads there. I do yeah. think that that's happening some. Horrible sound, man. No, the humming slowed down. He can still talk. Let Say him talk. <laughs> no, it's not good. Uh, hello? I'm Chris. Hello. No. Yeah. Maybe, Chris, maybe you should um, quit and rejoin us. Wow. So um, I do think that it's entirely possible that there's some trolling going on and, and uh, people just trying to be opportunistic. Um, and and uh, trust me, YouTube is full of... All right, let me think of a word I'm allowed to say on the air. Okay, I can't think of any words that are clean. So, you know, full of people I don't really like who are just, you know, there to make trouble and to, and to be annoying. So, and um, go ahead. So there's that, and we probably should move on, but the other thing I wanted to, that was kind of under my skin is this brings mm -hmm. up the whole idea of copyright and ownership and all this stuff, and people who create stuff have totally have every right to make money from for their work, mm -hmm. but like, how broken is the copyright system when somebody shoots video of first graders having lunch on the first day of school, and they're like, "Stop that! There's injunction." We copyrighted I mean, the concept of lunch, and you may not have any. 
Exactly. And at least not on YouTube, right? Yeah. So, I mean, that was that was the other thing I was going for, but I kind of mellowed out listening to you guys. Well, no, and I agree that I agree that the system itself is broken, and and that's partly why when people are creating content on YouTube, if they have no objection to other people using it, they should be doing Creative Commons licensing with their own stuff as opposed to standard licensing, just to kind of spread the love a little bit more. But um, there's there's a lot of ways that we can use copyrighted material in a way that does not infringe the law. We just have to be educated about it. And you can't, yeah, but, but you, at, at the same time, you can't just take copyrighted music and include it in your video because you want to. It's, it's not allowed. Oh, totally. But totally. at least the other side of that is the artists are having the opportunity. Like if somebody makes, you'll see videos a lot of times with like the lyrics of a song and somebody's put pictures in. It's their favorite song, blah, blah, blah. It has the entire copyrighted song in there. And so what happens is you can buy the song. And so the artist has the opportunity to make money. And, and the person who put the video up is like, yeah, okay, I'm cool with that because I am using your copyrighted work. And I think that's a step in the right direction for the way that they can have a new way to market their music. But there's also a lot of non-copyrighted or copyright-friendly stuff, like on Jamendo, that people can use in their videos if they want to. So there is, and it, and it's great. And I think going. Thanks for bringing up the Creative Commons license. That's a great point. I just I, I'm kind of like the how broken is copyright law that like we're even having this kind of crazy convoluted conversation. I mean, mm -hmm. it needs it needs to be reworked. To something that makes sense. Well, and copyright law is not is not catching up to the way technology works, and the fact that we can do all these things with our students, and our students can create all these things, but then we have to not share it with the world because there's this danger of copyright infringement, maybe. So exactly. it doesn't it doesn't match up with what we want to be able to have our students do. Chris might be back, and we should probably hang, move on. Yeah, I think Chris is back. Tips and tricks, uh, the Chrome lookup in tabs, I don't really understand it, so Sean, I would love it if you would explain that. I know you can, like, highlight a word, drag it off in a little yeah, new tab. Stop. Go to Chris. Go to Chris. I, uh, sorry, I can't look at the spreadsheet and the thing at once. All right, Chris. Fred, <gasps> can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, better. You're not broken anymore. You know what I had to do is I had to borrow uh, my, my, uh, my son's headphones. Minor, <laughs> minor junk, I guess. <laughs> so, anyways, uh, I, I'm I'm Chris Scott. I'm a Google Teacher Academy uh, UK. That's uh, in April this year. So I'm new to the crowd, and I'm here. So excited to uh, to be joining. Sorry, I'm late. We had. Uh, some family pictures we had to do. So, uh, and you look fantastic for them. Where are you physically located, Chris? Uh, I live in Orchid, California, which is um, kind of halfway between San Francisco and Los Angeles on the coast. Where are you metaphysically located? I am metaphysically located at Firestone Brewery. <laughs> <laughs> Does that nice. count? Awesome. That's awesome. It counts Good. with these guys, trust Good me. For me. <laughs> All right, for me. it more than counts. <clears throat> so cool. Chris, yeah. we, we'd so, like to hear what you think about things yeah. as we discuss them. Yeah, good. Okay, let me uh, just recap now that <laughs> we're all back together. <laughs> but uh, I, heard I heard a little bit, uh, and it's interesting. I've always, um, and I don't recommend this, but I just disregard copyright. Bad idea, I know, and someday it'll catch up to me. But, uh, you know, like, Copyright and stuff. that's why we invited you. I'm calling the feds right now. They're going to be catching up to you later this evening. Go ahead. Fair Sorry. use, baby. Use it or lose it. <laughs> I think he's stunned. Oh, I think he, no, no, I think he's literally frozen. I think he got tased by his kids' ears or, buds. Or by the, uh, the feds. Yeah, see? I sent them. Yep. Nice. Aww. So while he... Um, Unhinges. Um, shall we move into this Chrome lookup tabs thingy? Sure. Yes. So and this is kind of cool. And Diane, I thought you pointed me to this. Well, yeah, uh, I shared it, and then I didn't know I was going to be doing the show, so that's why I shared it at that time. Uh, so if you want to look up a word um, and you're using Chrome, you can just highlight the word, and you can right-click to define it. But you can also, when it's highlighted, just drag it up here and like drop it in between tabs. And it'll open a new tab, except for that time. 
<laughs> no, I've been there. Of course, you shouldn't ever do these things live, right? But let's try. <laughs> I practiced. Oh, that's cool. There it is. Define process at dictionary.com. So, um, like it, it's kind of always uh, been there in one shape or another, but it, I think that's just kind of nice. You can just drag, drop, there it is, have a new window, close it, or a new tab, close it, and be ready to move on. Oh my gosh, I'm going to use that all of the time. I know, right? It's, it's kind of oh, nice. That is amazing. Great. That is great. Sweet. Yep. Good find. Yeah, I just it, it flew by me on Google Plus the other day, yesterday. I don't even know when, and maybe it was today. And uh, I was like, "Oh, that sounds cool." I ha I don't know what half the stuff is, but it sounded cool. So, um, you you guys read? I see blogs sometimes. People saying Google Plus is is doing good, and other people are saying Google Plus is dead. You guys, you guys see that like sort of. Blog post well, out there. I I haven't seen it in a while, um, and I think people it's kind of a a a dead thing because I I think there's no denying Google Plus is still growing and still a force, and I think Google isn't really pushing it that much, but it's because it's still growing and it's still right. It's still like the the largest growing. Social network. Um, Facebook passed a billion users today, but still, you know, Google Plus has been around for a year, almost a year, or something like that. It was Ooh, the summertime, yeah. yeah. So yeah. yeah, so I, I think it's kind of funny because the posts talking about Google Plus, um, kind of mocking it, have just totally dropped off because yeah. people are like, people I've don't know how to deal with it. They're just like, um, it's working. Uh, I've yeah. seen a few posts where see, people seem to be retracting their earlier statements about it that were detractors and, and, and saying, oh, you know what, as, as it turns out, it does have staying power or whatever, you know? And um, I find myself using Google Plus a lot more than some of the other stuff, certainly than MySpace, but um, more than Facebook because Facebook is, is that I go to kind of catch up and see how people are doing and see what pictures people are posting, but it's like the people that I maybe see face to face or I'm, or I'm connected with in my life somehow before my career and then I'm using Google Plus primarily related to my career and and some of my interests like photography and things like that things that I want to see what people have to share but I'm finding it's it's a way better source in fact in some cases it's a better source for me than Twitter for links to blog posts I wouldn't have found otherwise because there is the visual aspect and it's bigger I and it catches my attention and it, it also give it has some of the authority of I see who shared it and then some of the other some of the other people who plus one did it. You are so dead to me, man. All right. Well let me let me just nice. add, I think that the killer app in Google Plus is this right here, Hangouts. Yeah. And even for people who aren't making podcasts and hangouts, I just had a meeting with uh, people on the other side of the country on a spreadsheet. And we, you know, all, all three of us were down at the bottom of the screen and we were working live on a spreadsheet together and it was incredibly productive. And I think it was more productive than a face-to-face -face meeting would have been. It was... Well, and I think that's the, you kind of hit it on the head there that um, Google Plus is, people are using it more strategically. So, like, mm -hmm. now that the mocking mm -hmm. and joking yeah. around is kind of over, people are like, wait a second, there's there's really something here and and kind of I gotta think about it and there are all these uses and applications for it. Yeah, my high school friends are not on, on Google Plus. Okay, I'm over that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well awesome, should we move on to uh, what is next? We lost our host, so what's coming up next is uh, Flight Search. Oh yeah, Sean, yeah. and you I shared that. So, um, yeah, and For all those jet setting are, pictures out there. Well, yeah, uh, or people like me who 
have been um, flighting a little bit more. But um, so flight search has always been around, but this is kind of a new little twist on it um, that you can get it on your tablet, and now you can do a pretty general search. For instance, in this example, it's let's say you want to fly between Seattle and October fly to Seattle between the 18th and the 22nd, and you can start setting parameters less than $250 on your flight, and it pulls up all of the flights that are available to you, and there's the, the, scroll, the scroll bar on top there, so you can kind of set the parameters and um, a little more options. I mean, if you've taken the search class like uh, Fred, you know that... <laughs> You've always been able to track flights, but now you can use Google more to book your flights and set parameters, almost using it as a database to which flights you want and and whatever, how much you want to pay, etc. Cool. What happened? Uh, we did Google Flight Search. No, I know. What happened to me? Oh, the feds kicked you out. <laughs> What's his face's fault, though? And then you came in and kicked um, Chris out. Oh, I have more respect for copyright law than he does, clearly. All right. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. So we're on Chrome add-ons. Wow. Well, I missed the Google Flight Search. Have you used yep. it yet? Have you I tried have, it? I just discovered it today. Okay. Yeah, I think it just got posted today. But you're going to be flying again soon anyway, right? So you're going to try it? I am, because I have to do a little research a this next week and look at some flights, so... Okay. I... YouTube options for Google Chrome. Is that what we're on? That's me. Go, Fred. So, in the um, GCT uh, listserv, there was a question about how to get rid of the uh, suggested videos at the end that all pop up all over the place and sometimes they're related and sometimes they're, they're not and they have um, s things you might not want to show in class. So I sent in this for um, as one of the answers possible and it's YouTube options for Google Chrome. When you install it, it gives you a ton of different choices to remove all the different annoying things that YouTube might have. You can take off all everything surrounding the video including all the comments and, and all uh, as well as at the end when it shows the suggested videos. So I would suggest that people check it out. Make sure that you read um, the huge down yellow pop up thing that came. Whoa. Yeah. I'm sorry? There was this huge yellow thing that popped up on my screen that I had to agree to. Right. And that's what I was getting at. If you scroll down on the Add to Chrome page, um, Warning explained when installing the extension, it says this extension can access your browsing history, your data on all websites. This is the default warning for any extension that needs content script access to all websites. This access is needed for detecting videos on third-party pages and previously opened windows or tabs. So it actually works even on those pages where there's an embedded YouTube video. So. All right, cool. We lost Sean. Who posted uh, Slide Rocket? That was probably Sean. Then he <laughs> should not have left. Well, I can talk a little bit about Slide Rocket. It's a uh, presentation plugin for Chrome, and it looks a lot glossier than, you know, a lot glossier than Google Presentations does. I uh, played around with it a little bit didn't seem intriguing enough for me to keep it going, but I don't know if Sean had a different experience. Maybe we'll get him back. Yeah. Well, I, I, I saw that there were two. There was Slide Rocket and there's Slide Rocket EDU. Mm -hmm. They have special accounts for education. Yep. Yeah, they do. And it, so you, it's, it's a, yeah, if you don't have the EDU account, it's more expensive. Sean's back. Sean, tell us why hey. we should prefer slide rocket over Google presentations um, I don't know I just think it's I I don't know that I would prefer it over but I'd like to have the tool available does that 
make sense. Slide Rocket is pretty slick the way it integrates with Google Apps for Ed and um, can really take a traditional PowerPoint or presentation and um, just as easy to use but totally takes it to the next level and just creates these beautiful almost the almost movie like presentations I so I dropped it in there I it it integrates into the control panel it's you can roll it out to the whole your whole domain it's pretty slick and again totally easy to use there's a side of it that I think is instructional more for if you got like your teaching staff on board using it than uh, students because there's a total analytics side to it. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. You can actually gauge how long um, people spent on each particular slide before they click through and stuff. So I think that could be really, really useful. So I thought it was worth dropping in there, giving it a little shout out. It's a great tool. So speaking of shout outs, in the today's meet at todaysmeet.com slash edreach. Wesley Fryer in Oklahoma and Juan DeLuca in Mexico and Nick Cusimano in St. Louis are all watching and contributing to the back channel. So just let's take a quick look. Um, Wes has used QuietTube for a while with some of the, to be able to, to cut out some of the issues and comments and things like that. Um, and he was loving your, your recommendation there, Fred, of the YouTube options for Google Chrome. Also, from our earlier conversation, Juan suggested a live binder that has a lot of Creative, creative Commons media in it. So that's pretty cool. And nice. um, Nick said hello. But last week, he contributed quite a cool thing here about uh, educators as curators. So, um, oh, so yeah, everybody's having a nice little talk in the, in the back channel today's meet. That's great. That's and great. I'm stoked that Wes Fryer is here because I've yeah. been listening to his podcast for a couple of years now. So... That's awesome. Wes is both an ed techer and a geocacher, so I like him on a, bu a bunch of fronts. We we all it's like the mutual admiration society. Shut up, John. All right. So, in our segment five classroom applications, Kevin, did you come up with this uh, teacher journal form? Yeah. So, uh, one thing that I've always been struggling with, and I've, I've known it's been a good thing to do, is just kind of keep a track of what's happening in your classroom through a journal, you know, what's worked, what hasn't. If, if, if you're a teacher and you're disciplined about doing that, it makes your life a lot better the following year because you can refer to that and you can see what worked and that sort of thing. You can keep track of what you're doing. And, you know, I've been trying to do that my entire career with paper journals and with using Google Docs and, and all kinds. I mean, there's a million tools that you could use to keep track of what's happening in your classroom just for yourself, right? So um, although I found the perfect tool is Google Forms. And um, the advantage to Google Forms is, uh, and, and a lot of people don't think that you can create forms. Most people create forms for other people to submit, but you can create a form just for yourself to submit. And what's great about it is, so let me just share my screen here. So I could be at a browser, not logged in at all, and click this link I have, and it'll take me to my teaching journal, which is just a paragraph form. Super, super simple. And the killer, awesome. the killer feature of this is that I don't need to be logged in. Because any friction, anything that prevents you from doing this will prevent you from doing this. So, if, so, so I've got a big link right on my Chrome right there. I also, um, I have it in my Nexus 7. I created a, you know, a link right on my home screen. I just click on that. Again, I don't need to be logged in, and it takes me right to that journal, and I can log in there. Super, super easy. It's all time-stamped. No one else uses this form but me, but I have constant access to it. Uh, and th again, the key is you don't have to sign in to submit to it. And that's awesome. That's taking it to the next level. So thanks, because I use I've created a couple forms for myself for things that I need to keep track of that I know really I'm never going to keep track of. Like your um, Diane, you're an app CT. Kevin, are you an app CT? I am. So like keeping track of those 
I'm never going to write those things down. That's why I keep it all on my website. But, <laughs> I just refer to that when I have to go report in. But I have, a, I have a form that I created for it so that I can just go in and whenever I do something, just and it has the... I created it with the same fields that we need to fill out. Yeah, yeah that's a good idea. Survey. So, so that way it. I just go in and I, I fill it out real quick because really I'm never going to, you know, it's the same idea. When it's frictionless and easy to do, I'll do it. But if I have to, like, write it down and refer to it somewhere else, it's never yeah. going to happen. So, And that's the yeah, big thing. I mean, people don't think you can make forms for yourself to fill out. Okay, so here's the plan. Sean, next time you're staying at Kevin's, you hack into something and get his form, and then you send it to all of us, and we start filling in things, and later Kevin will think it was himself. We put in some really weird stuff like, send money to Diane Maine. <laughs> I don't even need awesome? to hack in because he said he doesn't even log in. I just have to grab his Nexus. So. Yeah, basically yeah. you just got to yeah. get the get the um, the URL of his form, and we are Yeah, but you have to get Kevin. past this encrypted... Uh, Oh, look at the puppy. You know, is the puppy pattern I, I make. No, that's not it. <laughs> yeah, but Sean will just yeah. hit you over the head with something while you have while you're already logged into your Nexus Seven. Right, right. Yeah, we'll yeah. Because I'm so violent. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's pretty cool. I like your idea, Kevin. That's that's very cool. Thanks. And if I can ever find that form, um, I'm so <laughs> gonna send you notes. It's gonna be creepy. <laughs> awesome. So, that's going to, no, that's not going to do it. No, we have um, some upcoming we've got events, some yeah. upcoming events coming up. That's what upcoming means. And the Michigan Google Summit has sold out their conference with over 300 registered attendees. They have that a great lineup, awesome. and John Soash wants to invite Educast listeners to watch some of their uh, featured sessions. They're going to be live streaming them via Google+. Plus. So make sure you circle the MI Google page on Google Plus for complete details. John has created events for all the sessions that they're going to be streaming. And there's also a link in the show notes, and I realized that I didn't change all the pronouns um, in that little blurb when I copied it. Oops. We've also got the Oregon Google Summit coming up next week on Friday, October 12th. Sean, is it too late to... It's not too late, is it? To it's not too late. I just realized that I have, we haven't been sharing it like Oops. the other night. Oops, yeah, big oops. But yeah, it's coming up, so it's going to be good. And then also, Integrate Ed, formerly known as ITSC, uh, which is run by the OETC organization up in Oregon, they're having a, a brand new event uh, in San Francisco, and they're actually releasing some um, fantastic lowered group rates because they want to make this available to groups of people who work together because um, this event really works it's best if you've event. got cohorts. If you've yeah, if you've got cohorts of people that are gonna take what they're what they're doing and, and uh, take it back to their schools and stuff like that. So Integrate Ed is a conference for educators who want to improve their instructional practice with the effective integration of technology. It is not your traditional sit and get. It's very active. It's and so not, the, and there are some big big names that are mm -hmm. gonna be there and I'm not I like don't even understand how I got invited. But um, I'm talking about the other people that are going to be there. Dan Meyer and uh, Lisa Heifel will be there. Kent Shelton. Um, gosh, the the list is huge. Um, Diane, of course. Rachel Wayne <laughs> Cheney. Um, so the uh, the link is in the show notes. And from there you can go uh, in the agenda. You'll see the list of facilitators, some of whom Sean has mentioned. Um, you go to Integrate Ed sf.oetc.org and there's still space and uh, they're, they're offering some really really good deals for groups so take a look at that and with that that is going to do it for this week of the Google Educast show a big thanks to Fred uh, Kevin Chris who has been elusive but managed to, to hang out with us for a little while and Sean and also the cube also, a really big thanks to Wes and Nick and Juan and anybody else that didn't happen to throw their name into the Today's Meet who's been watching. We are so glad that you're there watching us. Uh, so far, it just looks like those three are the ones I can tell. And um, don't forget, oh, sorry, you can find us at, let's see, Fred, where can we find you? At plus.google.com plus Fred Delventhal. Slash plus Fred Delventhal. Uh, slash plus Fred Delventhal. Slash, slash, slash. Is that a forward slash or a backward slash? 
hack hack slash slash hack slash. Um, where can we find you, Kevin? He's gone. Just Google Kevin Brookhouse. Yeah, just Google like, Kevin Brookhouse. He's the only one. Sean, where where can we find you? Uh, Twitter is probably the easiest place to find me at Shani, mm -hmm. S E A N I. And Chris Scott, you can find him. His Google Plus is G Plus T O slash C Scottsy C S C O T T S Y. And I'm Dabigan, like it says in the little lower third there. That's where you can find me on Google Plus and also Twitter and stuff like that. Don't forget to follow at EdReachUs on Twitter. And of course, subscribe to our newsletter uh, at edreach.us slash newsletter. It's a great way to get the latest blog posts, podcasts, and news coming out of EdReach. Want to ask a GCT? You can always shoot us an email at googleeducast at edreach.us. Thank you again for joining us. Continue the conversation at the EdReach Network. And we will see you next week. Thanks, Dan, for hosting tonight. You're welcome. Great job. Hey, thanks. Good show, guys. Thanks. thanks, Cube. You're watching the Network.